Welcome to the third and final installment of TA Instrument Strategies for Better Rheology Data. In this segment, we join Dr. Bharath Rajaram, who will help us to identify sources of potential artifacts in data. Hello and welcome to the third and final segment of the Strategies for Better Rheological Data from TA Instruments. Today's segment focuses on sources of artifacts and advanced accessories for TA Instruments rheometers. We'll start off by looking at identifying sources of potential artifacts in your data, understanding what might be causing them, and go over ways on how we can mitigate these effects. The first artifact we're going to look at is inertial effects. Inertia is the def defined as that property of matter which resists any change in the momentum of that object. Inertial effects are important in oscillation experiments because we're constantly accelerating the rheometer geometry and shaft back and forth multiple times when we're applying a sinusoidal strain. The torque that it takes to do this, m, depends on the instrument inertia, the geometry inertia that's coupled into i, and d omega dt, how fast we're changing the angular velocity with respect to time. Systems with lower inertia are able to change direction much faster than systems with higher inertia. For example, think about comparing um, a small sports car and a large truck and how easy it is to change the direction in which you're traveling on the smaller sports car compared to a large and heavy truck. In single head rheometers, inertial effects are almost always present when we're doing oscillation experiments. This is because during each oscillation cycle, we accelerate the material to the maximum speed and then back down to zero speed again. These effects are particularly pronounced when we're dealing with um, low viscosity materials at high frequencies or working with samples that have very low stiffnesses. The inertial effects themselves can be minimized to some extent by changing the geometry that we're using on, for the specified experiment. For example, aluminum is a better choice than stainless steel and acrylic geometries are better choices than aluminum geometries because they have lower mass. Inertial effects tend to affect the measured rough, uh, measured phase of the angle. With TA instruments rheometers, we allow the user to plot the raw phase angle uh, so we have access to the actual phase angle before inertial correction is applied. When the raw phase angle exceeds 175 degrees for the DHR series or 150 for the AR series, inertial effects tend to dominate the measured um, data. Ways we can address um, the effects of inertia, one way would be to increase the stiffness of the sample to access a wider range of frequencies. Finally, inertial effects can also show up in creep tests as some sort of creep ringing in the early parts of the, of the experiment. Here are some examples of inertial effects when dealing with low viscosity samples. Shown here are frequency sweeps on three different silicone oils, S600, which has the highest viscosity, S60, a medium viscosity silicone oil, and an S3, low viscosity silicone oil, on the dual head separate motor transducer Aries G2 platform, and the single head combined motor transducer DHR platform. For the S600 oil, the highest viscosity material, the results from both instruments agree across the entire range of frequencies. When we go down to the uh, medium viscosity oil, S60, the results are in agreement for the most part. At, at the highest frequencies, we notice a slight uptick in the complex viscosity of S60. This effect is more pronounced when we are working with the low viscosity oil, S3, and we notice that the data above about 10 radian per second starts to shoot up significantly. And this is a result of inertial effects. One other way inertial effects could be present with low stiffness samples is when we're doing creep experiments. Shown here are results of, uh, of a creep test on both the Aries G2 and the DHR on Pond's cream. Uh, with the DHR system, we see initial creep ringing, and the, these effects are not present with the Aries G2. Note that some um, rheological information can be obtained by fitting certain models to the creep ringing data, so that's something uh, that might be useful or relevant to what you're doing. When we're looking at the phase angle in a single head rheometer, 
and when we're doing an oscillation experiment, depending on what your material is, we could have one of two possible cases. For a perfectly elastic material, the phase angle would be zero degrees. If the material is perfectly viscous, like a fluid, the phase angle would be 90 degrees. For, of course, for a viscoelastic material, we would have a phase angle somewhere between zero and 90 degrees. The closer it is to zero, the more elastic your sample is, the closer it is to 90, the more viscous or liquid-like your sample is. What can happen is, when we're working with low viscosity fluids, a lot of the, we need to apply a certain amount of torque to accelerate the sample, uh, the rheometer, uh, geometry and mass back and forth. We then collect a certain amount of torque from the sample as well. With low viscosity samples and at high frequencies, the torque that it takes to accelerate the mass back and forth can get somewhat large, and that's where the contribution from inertial torque comes into play. The inertial torque depends on three factors. The system inertia, this is the inertia of both the rheometer motor and the geometry that you're using for your test. The oscillation strain, um, the inertial torque increases linearly with strain, so larger your applied strain, the greater the inertial contribution. But perhaps the most important contributor to um, inertial effects come from the frequency that's being used. Inertial torque scales according to omega squared, which is why we were seeing these effects kick in at higher frequencies when we saw with the S60 and S3 silicone oils. Knowing the inertia of the rheometer and of the geometry that we're using, we can then apply a correction for the inertia and then um, get to our sample's um, corrected phase angle. Here's an example of how we treat and correct for inertia when we're doing oscillation experiments. Shown here is a frequency sweep on a PDMS sample. At low frequencies, we notice that um, we have good agreement between the phase angle delta, calculated phase angle, and the raw phase angle shown in green. As we start to step up to higher and higher frequencies, we start to see a little bit of a divergence between the raw phase angle and the phase angle. This is indicative of um, inertial effects starting to creep up and shows that increasing corrections need to be applied as we start to move to higher frequencies. Note that in this case, the raw phase angle and the actual sample phase angle don't differ by all that much. So this is not an extreme case where inertia is completely dominating our results. So we can say with some degree of confidence that our G prime, G double prime, and complex viscosity data for this sample are reliable. If we were to look at effect of inertia on G prime and G double prime for a lower viscosity sample, shown here are results for three different sample geometries, a 20 millimeter parallel plate, a 40 millimeter parallel plate, and a 60 millimeter parallel plate. Notice that the result, the G prime results for all three samples agree very well at low, lower frequencies. As we start to get up to higher and higher frequencies, the G prime starts to drop off first for the 60 millimeter parallel plate, then for the 40 millimeter parallel plate, and then finally for the 20 millimeter parallel plate. One way to get more insights into what might be causing this data, we can plot the raw phase angle. This is the phase angle of, uh, between the applied strain and the stress signals before any inertial corrections are applied. And we notice that the phase angle for the 20 millimeter, excuse me, for the 60 millimeter parallel plate shoots up to 180 degrees at, the low, at lower frequencies. Uh, the 40s is somewhere in the middle, and with the 20 millimeter plate, parallel plate, the raise in the phase angle occurs at the highest frequencies. This can be traced back to the inertia of the geometry. So we have uh, the system inertia and the geometry inertia that both contribute towards uh, the inertial effects in these systems. The system inertia, the inertia of the motor is fixed. So when we change the geometry, we're changing the total inertia of the system. And clearly, the 60 millimeter parallel plate has the highest inertia of these three geometries. Another place where uh, inertial effects can come into play, this time when working with solid samples, is when we're dealing with low stiffness materials. For example, something like an elastomeric sample. Shown here is um, a frequency sweep on a rubber elastomer-like material um, at room temperature, going from um, one to about 628 radians per second. 
we're showing the G prime signal as well as the raw phase angle. At lower frequencies, once again, for the four different geometries that we've used, the torsion rectangle, uh, 8, 12, and 25 millimeter parallel plates, the data agree very well, and the phase angle are all very similar to one another. As we start to get up to higher frequencies, because the sample stiffness is the least when we're working with the torsion compared to a 25 millimeter parallel plate, the phase angle starts to shoot up earliest for the torsion, then the 8 millimeter parallel plate, the 12, and then finally the 25 millimeter parallel plate. If we were to look at the um, oscillation torque um, for, these, for the same data that we looked at the previous slide, we noticed that there is a sudden drop in the, um, um, in the value of the oscillation torque. This drop can be attributed to system resonance, and that is sample specific. It is the point at which we're hitting the resonance point of the sample when we're investigating, uh, when we're doing our rheological test. One, the, best way to address this would be to change the sample stiffness, and this can be done by changing your geometry in which that you're using to do the test. Between the eight millimeter parallel plate and the torsion rectangle, we don't see all that much of a difference, but when we step up to the 25 millimeter parallel plate, we notice that the resonance frequency has been shifted up towards the end of our um, test range that, that we're um, running this test over. How can you mitigate the effects of inertia? One way to address this problem would be from the instrument design perspective. So using a dual head or a separate motor transducer design, something like the Aries GE2 platform, is the ideal solution. This is because we make, the motor applies the deformation, and we independently measure the torque that this deformation has generated using the force-free balance transducer. When working with the combined motor transducer or single head rheometer designs, the choice of the motor affects the inertia. Certain um, motor designs tend to have much higher inertia values, so the range of frequencies that you can access when working with low viscosity samples will be limited. Inertia can be treated in your data through measurement-based calculation corrections by looking at the phase angle, raw phase angle for each data point and then applying the inertial corrections for each point. Um, ac having access to the raw phase angle is critical because it allows you, the user, to know how much inertial effects are contributing towards your measured data and then um, treat it with appropriate caution. Locking the phase angle, for example, say to 90 degrees once inertial effects start to become prominent can be misleading because it does not reflect the true picture of what is happening with uh, the sample. Here's a comparison of rheometer architectures and how it is relevant to inertial effects. With a separate motor transducer or dual head design, the motor, again, moves on the bottom, and the torque is measured independently by a force or, and torque rebalance transducer. So the torque measurement itself is unaffected by the inertia because the motor is the primary moving element. With the combined motor and transducer design, we have a drag cup motor that's applying a certain amount of torque. So the motor itself is the primary moving element, and so the motor inertia is involved in some way or the other in making the torque measurement, which is why it's imperative to minimize the motor inertia as much as possible when designing the instrument. We'll switch gears a little bit here and look at um, the effect of normal force when working with, uh, on the modulus when working with soft elastomer samples. Shown here is um, a frequency sweep on a rubber-like elastomer sample at different amounts of normal force. So when we first, don't, when we don't apply any normal force at all, we get a certain um, modulus value. But then as we start to apply more and more normal force, we start to see the modulus value increase. Now what could be causing this? We also notice that the modulus value increases up to a certain point and does not increase anymore. This is indicative of the fact that the sample might not be completely flat. And as we apply more normal force, we're um, achieving better contact between the upper plate and the sample, which is why the, you know, the moduli values peak at about 20 newton, newtons of applied normal force and does not increase beyond that point. One way we can confirm this is to glue the sample onto the top plate and then test it on the rheometer. 
when we don't apply any normal force, again, our moduli values are somewhat low. But then as we, if we were to compare the results between 20 newtons of applied force, which establishes sufficient contact between the sample uh, and the top plate, and the glued sample, the results agree very well, indicating that this problem was just a result of applying insufficient normal force um, and therefore improper contact between the sample and the geometry. Now it is important to save the waveform with each data point. And reviewing the wave waveform can give a lot of information about the quality of the data um, that you're collecting. Shown here are the results um, for um, a strain sweep. We're looking at the modulus as a function of strain. And then the waveform is shown in the inset. At very low strains, we see that the data are fairly noisy with the G prime um, not, not being very consistent. If we were to look at the waveform, we can see that the applied strain is, is, an, is a sinusoidal um, wave, but the torque value is, is very, very noisy. As we start to increase the strain, this starts to be clear up a little bit. It takes, the torque value also takes a little bit more of the sinusoidal shape, allowing us to better resolve the viscoelastic components of this material. And as we increase the strain further, the torque value increases. So we get very nice stress and strain signals that are both sinusoidal. At some point, though, we go outside the linear viscoelastic region. And while the applied strain is still sinusoidal, the stress signal is not. So point graphs will give you access to uncorrected signals and also give you information about the raw phase angle before any inertial um, corrections have been applied. For most of this um, series, when we're looking at strategies for better rheology data, we have emphasized the need to be within the linear viscoelastic region. And the reason for that is, is elaborated on this slide. Once again, we're looking at a strain sweep on a material and looking at the waveforms within the uh, small amplitude oscillatory region, or SAOS. At small strains, for a, lean, for a sinusoidal strain, the response is also sinusoidal, so it's a simple analysis and we are able to resolve the viscous and elastic components. Once we start going outside the linear viscoelastic range, the response to a sinusoidal input is no longer sinusoidal, so we have to resolve it into additional harmonics and to, to be able to completely capture the, the um, material's response to um, the applied strain. So we're looking at that here. Uh, when, within the small amplitude oscillatory region, we're applying a sinusoidal strain. The stress then is shifted by a phase angle delta, but is again sinusoidal. Once we go outside the linear viscoelastic region into this region of large amplitude oscillatory shear, the stress signal that we get for an applied uh, sinusoidal strain is no longer sinusoidal and needs to be expressed as a Fourier series expansion having additional harmonic components. One way of looking at this is within the LAOS region. The sample rep response can be split up into um, a fundamental frequency where it, we have a component that is exactly out of phase by a certain phase angle, uh, very similar to what we would see within the linear viscoelastic region. But we also see some additional harmonics. And these are um, additional components that have frequencies that are three times your fundamental frequency, which is your test frequency, five times your fundamental test frequency, and so on. The amplitudes or intensity of these additional frequencies uh, can be represented as I3, I5, and so on. And it's relevant to look at the ratio of these um, higher harmonic intensities um, compared to the um, fundamental harmonic. And these are designated as ratio I3 over I1, where we're looking at the ratio of the third intensity to the first fundamental harmonic intensity. Looking at I3, I5, um, and all these additional harmonics is relevant because they indicate the onset of nonlinearity in the sample. Shown here is um, data from um, a strain sweep on an LDPE melt sample. And as we start to go outside the linear viscoelastic region, we can see the onset of these additional harmonics, the I3 and the I5. The inset also shows that we have the ability to directly collect and report uh, up to the ninth harmonic 
for all oscillation experiments from wooden trios. One thing to watch out for when doing LAOS experiments or when doing steady shear experiments on um, polymer melts is the possibility of edge fracture happening. Edge fracture happens when the sample fractures at the edge and is no longer uniformly distributed within the parallel plates. Ways to mitigate this, um, on the Aries G2, we have um, a cone and partition cone and par par parallel plate geometry, which consists of an upper partition plate that is connected to the transducer and an outside uh, plate coupled with a lower cone. Because only one part of the upper plate is in contact with the transducer, this is your measuring surface. And as you start to go to larger and larger strains, the sample fracture sets in, but it takes a while for that fracture to propagate from the edge to the edge of the me measuring plate, thereby delaying the onset of, um, of edge fracture. With the partition cone and plate, we are able to get up to free, uh, strains as high as 3,000%, whereas with the standard plate, we can only go up as high as about 100% per strain or so. Other effects that might be present in your data, wall slip. Wall slip can manifest as apparent double yielding, where you have a first yield event happening when your sample slips at the top, surf, top or bottom surface, and then another yield when your sample actually starts to yield. Shown here are results on yield stress measurements on toothpaste. Um, with the smooth plate, we notice um, a, an apparent yield stress that is much lower than the actual yield stress of this material. One way to check for um, the occurrence of wall slip is to run the same test at different gaps. If the sh applied shear profile is uniform, which is what we would expect for a well-behaved material, the results would be the same at all different gaps and they would all agree with each other. If your sample is showing some slip, the results at different gaps would be different and that is indicative of uh, wall slip occurring. We can correct for um, wall slip by using roughened plate geometries. Uh, at TA Instruments, we have uh, geometries with different surfaces that are surface finishes that are available. For example, a crosshat surface, serrated, sandblasted, or porous surfaces. Um, when working with um, roughened surfaces, of course, recommended to have roughened surfaces on both the top and the bottom to completely avoid any wall slip problems that might arise when you're working with gels or suspension type materials. Finally, when we're working with extremely stiff samples, there is the possibility that the sample becomes very stiff and we start to run into what's called compliance effects. This happens when the sample is as stiff as the frame of the rheometer itself. We're showing results from uh, a temperature ramp on, uh, on a polymer sample uh, two, on, done on two different geometries with a torsion bar and then a parallel plate. Let's first look at the parallel plate data starting from about 280 degrees C and then going downwards. We get good data and then at some point the sample um, freezes, becomes a solid, and then we reach a storage modulus plateau. Now if we were to combine this with torsion data starting at very low temperatures, we notice that the data agree within a small region, but the modulus plateau value that we saw with the parallel plate is artificially low. And that's a re that is because the sample becomes too stiff for testing with 25 millimeter parallel plates. With the, when we're looking at inertial effects, we spoke about the need to increase sample stiffness because we were dealing with very low stiffness materials. When we're dealing with high stiffness materials like a solid po uh, a polymer melt that has been cooled below its melting temperature, we need to decrease the sample stiffness and we would go in the opposite direction. So an eight millimeter plate would be a better choice than a 25 millimeter parallel plate and a torsion rectangle would be a better choice than an eight millimeter parallel plate. Notice that the tan delta peak shown on the bottom is the same for both materials. This is because compliance does not affect the position of that peak. It only affects the modulus, uh, the magnitude of the modulus um, once the sample has become very stiff. The last section of this segment, we will look at some advanced X3s that are available for uh, the DHR and the Aries G2 instruments.
When working with liquid samples, it's important to um, make sure the solvent does not um, evaporate over the course of your experiment. This can lead to some uh, artifacts like an artificial increase in the modulus, crusting along the edges of, of your geometry, and again, can lead to um, improper results. We can address this by using a solvent trap um, that's available for Peltier systems for both the DHR and the Aries G2 platforms. The solvent trap consists of a split cover ring that sits between a well on uh, solvent trap compatible geometries. Notice that the solvent trap sits very close to between the um, geometry and the parallel plate. The advantage of this design is that the space that the um, solvent vapor has to evaporate and to saturate is, is minimized. So you only lose, you lose very little solvent um, and once the volume within the solvent trap is saturated, you effectively diminish the, the driving force for further evaporation. We can also um, improve the efficacy of the solvent trap by adding a solvent in the, in the well of the solvent trap. This could be either water or silicone oil, like a non malt solvent like silicone oil, or apply some grease along the edges of the sol solvent trap. We can then create a, a, an interface that's more or less completely sealed and completely minimize the volume over which the solvent has to evaporate and, and get out. Shown on the right are results from uh, testing water at 40 degrees C. We notice that without using any solvent trap, the viscosity starts to drop quite a bit. Um, as water evaporates, we have less amount of water present between the two parallel plates, so the torque that we get is lower, so the apparent viscosity is also lower. Once we start using the solvent trap, we see an improvement, and we see that adding uh, water in the well or silicone oil in the well and using grease um, improves the results remarkably over a two-hour window. There are additional um, options available for the Peltier, placed, uh, Peltier plate systems as well. Um, when working with um, um, hydrogels, for example, it's important to prevent solvent evaporation, and we could do this by introducing humid air. This can be done using the purge gas cover that um, is available for the Peltier plate system. It also prevents condensation when doing subambient testing. With the Peltier plate, we're only heating from the bottom, so if we're taking the system to much higher temperatures, we could use an insulating thermal cover. This can actively conducts heat to the upper geometry and minimizes um, uh, any thermal gradients that might be there and provides uniform temperature control. This can become important when we're going at temperatures above 100 degrees C, for example. Um, we also have Peltier immersion rings available. These are compatible with all Peltier plates, and this is helpful when we're testing samples that have to be immersed in a certain fluid during the testing. Roughened surfaces um, are also available. Uh, these are plate surface covers that can be either cross-hatched or sandblasted. And these, are also, uh, these plate covers are also ideal for testing materials that can be too corrosive, very acidic, or very basic materials that can um, um, affect and destroy the uh, hard chrome anodized surface of the Peltier plate. The solvent traps are also uh, compatible with uh, the concentric cylinder geometry, and again, we work off the same design where we have, we completely seal the top. It's a two-piece cover that sits um, right on top of, of uh, um, the geometry, uh, the base reservoir, excuse me. <clears throat> For the uh, concentric cylinder, uh, we have a pressure cell accessory, and this is a sealed vessel that allows you to test uh, the rheology of your sample under high pressure or high temperature conditions. It can be pressurized up to uh, 2,000 PSI, or 140 bar, um, and works over a temperature range of minus 10 to 150 degrees C. The cylinder inside the vessel itself is driven using uh, a magnetic bearing, a magnetic coupling. So the, there's a magnet that is, uh, that is installed onto the shaft, and we then magnetically couple and drive um, a concentric cylinder geometry inside our pressure cell. This allows us to completely seal uh, the pressure cell 
allowing us to either apply an external pressure or allow the sample to internally build pressure, um, which, which can be relevant um, when you're testing volatile materials, for example, at, at higher temperatures. Shown is an example um, of uh, the effect of pressure on, on motor oil. Um, as we start to increase the pressure, we notice that uh, the sample viscosity also starts to increase. Um, this can be relevant, as shown in this example, when we're dealing with samples that um, are subject to high pressures um, in their end-use applications. For the concentric cylinder, um, we also have the option for testing solid samples under immersion. So any materials that's, that is a rectangle, uh, it can be made into a rectangle bar, um, can be tested using the concentric cylinder Peltier jacket, which affords uh, temperature control. This allows you to track changes, like uh, changes in the mechanical properties that occur during swelling or plasticizing. Um, and it's relevant to real world applications where your, your material might be, sub, um, might be deployed in an environment um, where it comes into contact with uh, harsh solvents like a saline environment um, or rubber seals that are in contact with, with solvents. Um, a more practical example uh, um, is, is looking at the rheology of pasta during cooking. So shown here is um, we, a pasta uh, sheet that, that was used in the torsion immersion um, geometry. Initially, we were mo monitoring the modulus before adding water. And then once we add water, we see that the modulus starts to drop as, as it absorbs the water, becomes a little bit softer. Then follow this up with uh, a temperature ramp followed by um, an isothermal hold. And what we're doing is basically cooking the pasta and looking at how its material properties change um, during the process of, of cooking. Finally, for the uh, uh, Peltier uh, plate um, or, or um, as it, we, we have the option of, of a generic container holder, which is just a base platform that can hold any container with diameter between 30 and 80 millimeters. Um, this is ideal for testing materials like yogurt that have structure that cannot be uh, loaded between parallel plates, or for testing materials like paint uh, in cans right off a production lot. So it's ideal for um, QC type applications. Certain materials um, tend to cure when they're exposed to UV light. And it's important to understand how their material properties and their reality changes uh, as, the curing property, uh, as the curing occurs. Towards this end, we have UV light uh, guide curing accessories available for both the DHR and the Aries G2 rheometers. They hook up to an external mercury lamp-based light source uh, and with a maximum light intensity of 300 milliwatts per square centimeter. Uh, there's a collimated light and mirror assembly that ensures uniform irradiance across the entire sample. Um, and the mercury lamp provides a broad spectrum uh, light source, but we can use filters to, to, to um, bring it down to the relevant wavelengths of interest for your specific application. Uh, there is an optional, uh, there is a, a, a uh, a cover that comes with nitrogen purge port ports in case your sample is sensitive to um, degradation. And there are optional disposable acrylic plates. Um, so it allows you, if your sample cures off, cures very hard on exposure to UV light, you could swap them out instead of using expensive quartz plates um, for, uh, for this type of testing. As an alternative to the mercury bulb, um, we also have an option of UV light um, curing accessory. This is an array of UV lights, uh, UV bulbs that, are, uh, that have a specific wavelength. Um, the 365 nanometer wavelength option has a maximum intensity of 150 milliwatts per square centimeter. The 455 nanometer wavelength um, light, light option has a maximum intensity of 350 uh, milliwatts per square centimeter. It's a more sens uh, environmentally sensitive um, um, option compared to the mercury bulb uh, technology. Uh, the light is uniform across the entire plate and there is no degradation in the intensity or the performance over time as might happen with the mercury bulb. And once again this comes with uh, uh, nitrogen, uh, has a cover with nitrogen purge ports and is compatible with disposable acrylic plates as well as quartz plates. <clears throat> 
Um, a couple of examples in looking at how the UV uh, light can affect the cure profile. Um, we're showing a UV sensitive um, adhesive uh, that cures on exposure to UV light. Um, we're applying um, UV light at 50, 100, and 150 milliwatts per square centimeter. And we noticed that the G prime modulus or the complex uh, modulus reaches a plateau value, and that plateau value is consistently higher as we increase the UV light intensity. If we were to zoom in on the point where the G prime, G double prime crossover occurs, we also notice that it gets shifted to shorter times when um, we increase the light intensity. Note that the um, light can be actuated, turned on and off from within TRIO software, and we have complete control over how long the light in, um, how long light is on and how much intensity um, the sample is subjected to during these tests. The UV um, um, accessories also have temperature control. Shown here are examples of, um, of, of curing at 100 milliwatts per square centimeter at two different temperatures. And again, we notice how uh, changing the temperature can affect how your material cures um, for so you're able to test at the temperature that your sample is, uh, your material is being applied at. A small angle light scattering accessory uh, allow, gives you access to simultaneous rheology and scattering uh, and, and structure information uh, by looking at scattering patterns. We shine a laser beam through the sample and we look at the scattering pattern that this generates. Different materials scatter light differently because of refractive index differences. And um, by looking at the pattern, we can get information of, about um, how your sample is aligning, looking at crystallization effects, phase separation, and so on. Um, here is an example of, of, a, of an EHAC surfactant solution uh, that is being sheared under constant steady state shear. At low shear rates, when we don't really see any appreciable um, scattering pattern, it's more or less uniformly dark. But as we start to ramp up the shear rate from 30, 50 to 100 and 200 um, inverse second, we start to see the emergence of um, a characteristic butterfly pattern that um, is indicative of phase separation occurring um, in, in, this, in this material. So this, is, this could be a very useful tool to understand uh, microstructural changes that might be accompanying um, shear flow with, with your materials. Finally, we're looking at uh, interfacial accessories, the ability to do, um, to measure the rheology of fluids at two interfaces. This could be of a liquid-liquid interface or a liquid-air interface. Uh, there are different options available for um, doing such tests. Uh, the bicone option is, was the one that was introduced the earliest. Um, and that gives you access to steady shear viscosity at air-liquid or liquid-liquid interfaces. The Dunoy ring is a little bit more sensitive and gives you qualitative viscoelastic uh, measurements at fluid-fluid or fluid-air interfaces. The patented double-walled ring geometry gives you quantitative viscoelastic measurements at air-liquid or liquid-liquid interfaces. This, is, this can be relevant when you're working with enhanced oil recovery applications, for example, or with food or biomedical applications. And it allows you to quantify the effect of protein assembly, for example, on a surface or surfactant assembly um, on, on a surface and looking at how it changes your material's um, flow behavior. The double wall ring interfacial system is patented by TA Instruments and is available for both the DHR and the AREG2 series uh, rheometers. Um, shown is the range of um, interfacial complex viscosities that can be accessed using the double wall ring and how that compares with other um, magnetic interfacial needle rheometers um, that are commercial rheometers that are out there. Uh, the double wall ring spans nearly five decades of magnitude in terms of the range of complex viscosities that you can access um, using, using the DWR. Shown here is another example of how um, um, looking at uh, the uh, interfacial viscosity can be relevant. Um, we're looking at a surfactant um, span 65 um, in water and 
gradually increasing the amount of, of, um, of the surfactant on the surface. Uh, water is Newtonian, so we are able to establish a baseline uh, value. But as we start to increase the amount of surfactant, we notice that the interfacial viscosity also increases, indicative of some sort of a structure uh, that might be forming on, on the surface. Um, the next accessory we will be looking at is the dielectric accessory that is available for both the DHR and the Aries G2. This allows you to make simultaneous dielectric measurements or uh, along with, with rheology. The dielectric system consists of um, an external LCR meter that can be completely controlled from within trios. The LCR meter gives you access to inductance, capacitance, and resistance information about your sample as it's undergoing some sort of a change. The geometries themselves are grounded with ceramic insulators, and they're compatible with both your, um, and there's special geometries that are available both as standard plates or, for, or as disposable plates when uh, we're testing materials that cure. Um, the dielectric um, accessory can be used as a standalone dielectric um, um, for making standalone dielectric measurements where we're, we're applying a certain amount of normal force and um, temperature control that the rheometer affords. Or we can combine it with rheological measurements to do dielectric rheology measurements at the same time. The range of temperatures that can be accessed is, is fairly wide, as low as minus 160 to as high as 350 degrees C. And it's relevant when we're looking at materials that, ha that are polar, uh, like PMMA, PVF, uh, PVC, and so on. Um, the plot shows uh, a temperature ramp, a dielectric temperature ramp on PMMA. Um, and we're looking at uh, the tan delta from the dielectric signal at different applied frequencies, um, 1,000 hertz, 10,000 hertz, and so on, all the way up to 1 million hertz. Dielectric tests are there, could therefore be a good way to complement the range of frequencies uh, that are accessible on the rheometer and extend that range to much higher values when you're working with pol polar materials or looking at materials um, like epoxy materials that cure and looking at how their polar behavior changes uh, as the sample is curing. We also have an option for looking at uh, how uh, the rheology of materials can change when they're subject to an external electric field. Uh, this is afforded by the Electro-Rheology X3 or the ERX3. Once again, we have grounded geometries with ceramic insulators that are hooked up to an external um, source that is capable of applying up to um, 4,000 volts um, DC. It's completely programmable from within trios, um, and there are a wide range of, of voltage profiles that are available. Um, you can apply a constant voltage, you could do a step voltage and hold it or ramp it up. You could also do sine voltage profiles or triangular voltage profiles um, or wave functions with DC offsets. The plot shows um, uh, an example of how the viscosity of a starch and oil suspension changes when we apply different amounts of DC voltages to it. As we increase the amount of voltage, we notice the viscosity of the material increases. So this, is, this material behaves as a shear thickening solution when we apply an external field. This property can be exploited for um, designing hydraulic valves and clutches, um, shock absorbers, bulletproof vests, um, coming up with flexible electronics, um, and so on. Finally, uh, we'll look at the triborheometry accessory um, that, that, is, that we've recently launched for both the Aries G2 platform and the DHR series of rheometers. Tribology is a study of two surfaces, two interacting surfaces that are in relative motion. Basically, we're looking at the friction between these two surfaces as we start to slide or move them on, on, on each other. This is relevant to understanding um, solid and liquid lubrication, understanding the performance of lubricating oils and greases, uh, looking at effects of friction, wear, and surface damage, uh, and understanding how surface modification and coatings improves the performance of your um, specific material. To do a tribology test where we're looking at friction, the two surfaces need to be in intimate contact with one another. And this requires very small gaps and an excellent alignment between the two parallel plates um, at these small gaps. We achieve this by using a flexible beam coupling that introduces a little bit of um, compliance in the system, allowing the two plates to be completely 
um, on top of each other. We can then apply a suitable amount of normal force um, to make sure the samples are in contact and understand how, how changing the normal force affects the uh, coefficient of friction for your material with and without uh, lubrication. We have four different uh, options that are available uh, for tribor rheology. Um, the four uh, uh, configurations could be a, a ball on three plates, having three balls on the top on a plate on the bottom, uh, a ring on a plate, or a ball on the top with three different balls on the bottom. This type of geometry, uh, the ball on three balls configuration, is preferred for testing, looking at asphalt lubricity. The ring on plate geometry is particularly relevant when we're dealing with uh, uh, looking at cosmetic lotions uh, and personal uh, care products. Uh, here's an example um, where we're looking at the uh, coefficient of friction of PVC on steel with uh, a silicone oil as a lubricant. Uh, the geometry used is the three balls on plate. Uh, this could be relevant to looking at how grease, uh, greases perform and how changing your grease formulation changes the coefficient of friction. Um, and we, we noticed that we are able to construct um, uh, a, stribe, a classic Strybeck curve and capture the three different uh, regimes of lubrication. We see hydrodynamic lubrication, um, where at large gaps, um, hydrodynamic effects tend to dominate. And then at, at low speeds, we have uh, boundary lubrication, where the two surfaces are in intimate contact with one another. For personal care products, again, we could uh, uh, show here are some results of uh, uh, tribology testing on Vaseline and baby oil with, uh, with the tribal rheometry geometry. And we see that baby oil has a much lower um, friction over the range of pressures that we've investigated um, compared to Vaseline. We will conclude this segment by looking at uh, a new capability that has been introduced on the Aries G2 for doing orthogonal superposition testing, or OSP. OSP allows for axial deformation perpendicular to shear deformation at the same time. The way we achieve this is by actuating the um, normal force FR FRT transducer of the Aries G2 to be able to move the top plate up and down at the same time as we're applying shear deformation on the bottom. This opens itself up to two possibilities. Orthogonal super superposition, OFP, where we're applying a steady shear at the same time as we're oscillating the top, uh, a small amplitude oscillation at the top, at the same time as steady shear rotation. This is relevant to looking at the nonlinear uh, behavior of complex fluids, understanding how structure breaks down as we oppose shear flow. Um, we could also do 2D SOWs, where we're applying a small amplitude oscillatory strain in two dimensions at the same time. So the motor on the bottom is doing its um, small amplitude oscillation, and the FRT on the top is also applying small amplitude oscillation at the same time. And this is important to characterize um, anisotropic effects in complex fluids. Shown here is an example of um, OSP on the Aries G2. Uh, with look, we're looking at a 2% xanthan gum um, solution and doing a frequency sweep at the same time as we're applying um, a steady shear um, rotation. You notice as we increase the um, applied shear rate, the crossover point between the G prime and G double prime switches to higher frequencies, indicating, this, indicating that this structure is starting to break down as, as we're applying flow. Now this is fairly intuitive, but this is a way, this gives you a way to get quantitative G prime and G double prime values um, of your material as it's being subject to shear flow, um, and that might be relevant with, uh, for example, looking at how uh, your material's properties change as it's being pumped through a pipe. Um, the 2D SAUS um, gives you a way to look at anisotropic effects. Um, the plots here show um, results uh, from uh, a, a dental adhesive. We're applying a small amplitude uh, strain in two dimensions at the same time. Um, and if we were to look at the axial strain versus the angular strain, which is the shear direction, we notice that that is um, 
is nice and isotropic, meaning we're applying the same amount of strain in both directions. But if we look at the stress signal corresponding to this deformation, we notice that that is um, prominently oriented along the axial direction, indicating that this structure has, uh, this material has some sort of an underlying structure that shows anisotropic effects. Um, it's prominently oriented in one direction, which allows, and this can have implications of how you um, process and flow this material when it has um, pronounced orientations in one direction versus another. Finally, the option to, um, to apply small amplitude oscillations in the axial direction opens up the possibility to use the Aries G2 as a, as a DMA or for doing dynamic mechanical analysis of solid materials. We lock the, um, the regular shear motor in a home position and then we just um, actuate the FRT transducer to apply a small amplitude oscillation in, in the axial direction. Um, the maximum amplitude of the oscillation is 50 microns, but this allows you to test solid materials in three-point bending, compression, um, and in tension modes. Um, shown here is an example of uh, testing PET film in tension on the Aries G2, and we are able to capture the effects of, of the transition as evidenced by the peaks in the tan delta, look for um, 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 changes in these material properties that previously required um, a separate instrument, um, something like an RSA G2 or a DMA Q800 to do these tests. Um, finally, we will look at some ongoing, uh, some opportunities for uh, options available for ongoing education at TA Instruments um, through the website. Within the TA Instruments website, we have a separate subsection for training resources. And within that, you can access um, information about our theory and applications course, um, quick start courses, um, applications library that has a wide range of different applications um, and tests and test results for a wide range of materials on different instruments. Um, the theory and applications course are held multiple times, usually six to eight times a year at the, at the Newcastle um, facility. Um, these are usually a one day long course that covers the theory of measurement, uh, instrumentation design and operation, calibration verification techniques, troubleshooting, data analysis, and goes over typical applications. The courses can also be offered on site at your location if um, you have multiple users who, who have to be trained on, on, um, on these topics. We also have quick start e-training courses uh, that are designed to get new users up to speed with using um, thermal analyzers or rheometers. These are 60 to 90 minute long uh, pre-recorded courses that can be viewed anytime. Um, they're available online and they're ideally aimed at new users who, have to, who would like to familiarize themselves with the operation of the instrument. And these courses are available to all users at, at no extra charge. Finally, we have uh, a series of TA Tech Tip videos that are available on YouTube. These are short two to four minute videos that go over different um, um, techniques, sample loading techniques, for example, um, and data analysis techniques in rheology, clamp calibration techniques in, in DMA, um, and are very helpful for, under, for getting better data um, from your instruments. These can be accessed, again, through our YouTube um, TA Tech Tips um, channel. We typically have a new TA Tech Tip every week, and we have over 100 videos currently. That concludes the third and final segment of the Strategies for Better Rheology Data um, series. This presentation will be archived and will be available online through the TA Instruments website. Thank you for your interest. This concludes the Strategies for Better Rheology Data from TA Instruments. Be sure to go back and view the first two segments on fundamentals, sample preparation, and testing guidelines. These and many other resources are available on the TA Instruments website. Feel free to ask any questions you may have in the Q&A window, as well as explore the additional resources provided by clicking the resource widget. From all of us here at TA Instruments, thank you for your interest.